Hello and welcome back to my channel. My name is Anastasia and I am super excited to be filming the second episode of my new series which is all about learning languages by reading books and for today's episode I've picked this book The Picture of Dorian Gray by Oscar Wilde, the Irish poet, playwright and novelist even though it's the only novel he ever wrote, isn't it? Anyway, we are going to be discussing the novel in the first part of today's video along these lines. You know the points, don't you? Um, well, based on last week's videos, I shall say. And you might have noticed that uh, my first episode has become rather long. And so I've decided to set a timer. Let's crack on. You guys, I am still processing this novel. I've um, reread it in some places. If I'm honest, I did read it in the summer and it's not the best holiday read. In the first opening chapters, we actually get to know the three characters that play a huge role in this novel, being Dorian Gray, Lord Henry Watton and Basil Hallward. And so we learn that Basil and Henry, they've known each other for ages. They must have met um, in Oxford back then. And we also learn that Henry went to Eton. And so he is one of those super privileged gentlemen in the English society. Just in Basil's studio, he's an artist, he's a painter, that Dorian actually meets Henry because Basil draws a portrait of Dorian Gray. So they um, are having a conversation and Henry is um, being open about his um, life philosophy and so he thinks that people are afraid of their passions, they should not inhibit every impulse they have. Um, the only um, thing worth pursuing in life is pleasure and if we strangle an impulse then it stays in the mind and becomes poisonous and the society, meaning the late Victorian society, is so colourless that sin is the only colour left to make use of and so on and so forth and so we also learn that he's um, deceived his wife on a uh, 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 many occasions, so he's not uh, faithful. And we also learn that, well, um, we can't be sure, but according to what Henry says, uh, his wife hasn't been faithful uh, either. Right, when uh, uh, Henry and Dorian are allowed to take a peek at the uh, picture, they are struck by it. Um, um, it, it's quite beautiful. Um, we also learn that Basil is struck by Dorian's beauty, uh, Dorian uh, being a source of inspiration for Basil and his art. And yeah, and so um, Dorian, on the one hand, is super happy to um, to uh, to possess such a picture. On the other hand, he um, admits that he's um, rather upset because it's him who will age and gets wrinkles and, you know, uh, become, as time goes by, hideous and dreadful and ugly, but the picture won't age and um, at some uh, point it will actually mock the aged version of Dorian. And so he says out loud that he, he'd rather the picture aged and not him and so he'd love to stay young all his life. Uh, it seems to have worked because um, from now on every scene, scene um, every dreadful thing uh, Dorian does um, leaves its marks on the picture uh, but not on him. And so um, it's like in the novel when we talk about the story time, like 20 years go by, but um, Dorian stay, stays uh, as young and as beautiful as he was 20 years ago, right? Uh, but the picture has become rather hideous and dreadful and um, so unbearable to look at that Dorian decides to lock it up in the attic. No one has access to the keys uh, except Dorian. Um, yeah, he does not want the society to find out what lies below his charm, right? 
uh, because and we also learn that uh, the picture embodies Dorian's soul again this nice antithesis body and soul so if we can sort of quickly touch up on the themes um, obviously uh, we've got so what Henry is preaching uh, is hedonism or it's also called the new hedonism and so instant gratification um, self-indulgent self-indulgent sensualism pleasure debauchery marriage and adultery of course um, um, the pursuit of youth um, faith and being faithless uh, yeah so it's actually packed with themes um, yeah so in terms of um, the plot a long story short what happens is he meets I, an innocent young girl um, at the beginning of the novel. Her name is Sybil Bain. Uh, she's an actress in a, uh, quote, rather wretched theatre for working class people. And she falls in love with him. Um, he sees her on the stage. He is awestruck and, um, of course, head over heels in love with her. And, um, yeah, he invites his friends to come and see her performing. But because she's in love with him, she performs rather poorly, based on what the narrator tells us, tells us, right? And it's actually the third person narrator. It's an authorial narrator, so he knows, like, everything. Um, yeah, the studio was filled with rich odor of roses, and when the light summer wind stood amidst the trees of the garden, they came through the open door, the heavy scent of the lilac or the more delicate perfume of the pink flowering thorn. Okay, so... Uh, from the corner of the divan of Persian saddlebags on which he was lying, smoking, as was his custom, innumerable cigarettes, Lord Henry Wharton could just catch the gleam of the honey sweet, and so on and so forth. So the third person narrator, in terms of the point of view, so who sees um, and who perceives, so the focalizer, I have um, a couple of instances. So Henry preaches a lot of things and Dorian takes it upon himself to put those preachings into practice, right? And he is shocked by this revelation. Um, and so on page 33, uh, we, uh, we've got this narratological tool again, it's called Free Indirect Discourse. How uh, can it be spotted? So we need the third person singular and the past, simple past tense. And so we've got music had stirred him like that, but music was not articulate. Words, mere words, how terrible they were. One could not escape them. Okay, so we've got how terrible they were, one could not escape them. Right. Time's up. I'll give myself an extra five minutes to wrap up the first part, right? Instance of um, Henry being a vocalizer. Uh, also on page 33, of course, he was amazed at the sudden impression that his words had produced. He had merely shot an arrow into the air. Had it hit the mark? How fascinating the lad was! So we've got multiple perspectives here, right? It's not only uh, one character who sees something, feels something, experiences something, but it's actually, well, um, a couple of characters. And that's, I think, more interesting. Sybil performs poorly, he's disappointed with her, he tells her that he's disappointed with her, he breaks up with her and he breaks her heart, obviously. Not long after that, she commits suicide. Her death haunts him throughout the novel, and her older brother, James, or uh, they call him Jim, promises uh, himself to kill Dorian in an act of revenge or vengeance, right? Uh, yeah, it's um, not a happy life. Dorian lives, and it does not end well. Um, so much I can tell, but no more, because I would probably tell too much and I don't want um, yeah, to to take away this experience, this reading experience from you guys. I think that's it with regards to the plot. Then we've also touched upon the themes. Style, well Oscar Wilde is known for his like, um, he's master of, um, of um, the pen. Uh, of course it's beautifully written uh, for a reason, of course like but sometimes it's really interesting because on the one hand um, Henry um, criticizes the traditional Victorian values um, and virtues and so on and so forth and also this realism 
and well the book was published in 1891 so it's uh, late Victorian England right we know that uh, 1900 it's called Fin du siècle right and so um, and Oscar Wilde was also known for um, preaching mm, um, art for art's sake you don't have to to write morally right things or ethically right things you've got to produce beautiful things and uh, but however like uh, one chapter is completely devoted to describing interesting things um, in a couple of cultures and it's so tedious I thought uh, and it was it was so realist realist in terms of being like part of that realism right let's um, have some coffee and then move on to the second part which is all about language Mm -hmm. I'll see you in a couple of seconds. Welcome to the second part of today's episode where we're going to be talking about the language that I find interesting, right? So like phrases or um, individual words or clauses or sentences. We'll see. So I am gonna set a timer again to prevent myself from talking too long and to prevent this video from becoming too long, right? Oh, my sticky notes, of course. So, it's actually this novel that I've consciously learned the word wreath. Henry was smoking and producing thin blue wreaths of smoke. Then we've got also he smoked innumerable cigarettes. Interesting in terms of morphology. So we've got number, numerous, innumerable. Then we've got the long unmown grass. I thought it's interesting because of the past participle. So we've got mo, moan, isn't it? Easel uh, is obviously a present here because we are dealing with a painter, and so it's this large thing covered with canvas to draw on. So the next phrase goes like this. It's about Dorian, as though he sought to imprison within his brain some curious dream. So this sought is interesting phonologically. Sought together with thought, this um, th, a phoneme, a dental fricative, th, as opposed to s, s, is it s, alveolar fricative. Uh, so they are a minimal pair. Then we've got Henry elevated his eyebrows, like this, this elevator that device that brings you up in the building. Henry smokes an opium-tainted cigarette, probably to lose his senses, to become oblivious to the reality that he hates so much, the Victorian England. Henry thinks of Dorian as made out of ivory and rose leaves. He must have been really beautiful. Puss asks, uh, or yeah, says to Henry, you shrug your shoulders. You shrug your shoulders, right? So it's like a collocation. Shrug your shoulders. Henry says, I'm telling you the truth. Okay, so interesting that it's always with the article the, the truth. The truth is that Henry says to Basil, I didn't know you were so vain. Vain. I know the phrase in vain. Then we also learn that, um, so Basil says to Henry, your rank and wealth my brains and my art and Dorian Gray's good looks. I thought it's a nice characterization of uh, the three characters. When I like people immensely, so meaning massively, Basil says, I have grown to love secrecy. I thought the phrase was nice. Um, if they know nothing of victory, they are at least spared the knowledge of defeat. So we've got this nice juxtaposition, victory, defeat, and also know of knowledge of um, Henry says one charm of marriage is that it makes a life of deception absolutely necessary for both parties but when she does find me out she makes no row at all and I was like yes row again so she finds me out sort of she catches me out so she finds out that I've been cheating on her that's my interpretation so basically he's talking about adultery here, isn't he? And then also an interesting word, um, Basil says, every portrait that is painted with feeling is a portrait of the artist, not of the sitter. Also the word the sitter, so of course you sit. 
So you see, and then you're not allowed to move. And so the artist draws your picture, right? Also interesting grammatically is I have always been my own master. Had at least always been so till I met Dorian Gray. So this is something uh, Basil says to Henry. I have always been up until now. I had always been until I met Dorian, right? So, uh, so present perfect. Then we've got past perfect, and then we've got simple, a uh, simple past. Okay, so it's really interesting how you can use English tenses to express this time references. It's really interesting. I was on the verge of a terrible crisis in my life, on the verge of a terrible crisis in my life. A curious sensation of terror came over me, like I was gripped by terror. I had a strong feeling that fate, capitalized, had in store for me exquisite joys and exquisite sorrows. We were destined to know each other. You are hard on her. I simply fled. Also, the past simple of, of to flee, isn't it? Then Dorian Gray plays the piano. So, to play a musical instrument, you always uh, put the definite article before the instrument. Play the violin, play... Uh, what else can I play? The guitar. Either of us. I really like this construction. So, you've got either of us, neither of us. Alicia, you need a pair. We had neither of us, we've got none of us. So, neither of us, you need a pair like two people. None of us, you can have more, if I'm not mistaken. You are indifferent to everyone. I thought it interesting because it's nothing to do with different, right? Indifferent, so not interested, actually. How horribly unjust of you, says Henry to Basil. I thought it's also interesting because we've got just, unjust, Justice and injustice. Different prefixes, isn't it interesting? So we've got, I quite sympathize with the rage of the English democracy against what they call the vices of the upper orders. And then it, it's followed by the indignation was magnificent. So indignation and rage are like synonymous. I don't suppose that 10% of the proletariat live correctly. Yeah. Proletariat, 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 like the working class people. I must be merely an acquaintance. Acquaintance, like somebody you know. Fleetingly, perhaps. If one puts forward an idea to a true Englishman, so you can put forward an idea, like demonstrate, propose. The more insincere the man, so um, as opposed to sincere, insincere. I don't propose to discuss. Time's up! I'll give myself an extra five minutes, if that's okay with you. I don't propose to discuss politics, sociology or metaphysics with you. Again, no article. I see things differently, right? The adverb differently. The harmony of soul and body, no article needed. A realism that is vulgar. Yeah, so I've talked about Henry's criticism of realism. Now and then he is horribly thoughtless as opposed to thoughtful. The thoroughly well-informed man. So it's something uh, Henry criticizes in uh, the late Victorian uh, society back then. Uh, what people were after is to get informed. So the thoroughly well-informed man. They care about their minds, but their souls are naked and starve. Genius lasts longer than beauty. Both nouns are capitalized. A romance of any kind is that it leaves one so unromantic. Those who are faithful versus the faceless, right? The faithful, the faithless. The man bowed and went up the walk. There you go. Bow to bow. When he caught sight of Lord Henry, a faint blush, he caught sight of, right? He saw him. I'm far too frightened to <laughs> and you're far too charming i love this phrase in english you put emphasis on something by saying far too many far too much far too frightened far too charming henry flung himself down on the divan this phrase comes up quite often in this novel and it was like fling oneself is it fling oneself reflexive verb in english that's a rarity Friends' whims are laws to everybody. 
he's in one of his sulky moods and I can't bear him when he sulks. Yeah, so you've got the verb to sulk, being really sad, not being crumpy perhaps, and being in, in, in a sulky mood. Besides, comma, I want you to tell me why I should not go in for philanthropy. It must be dreadfully tedious. It was so unlike Basil. So really like this word unlike when you are contrasting somebody or something. They made a delightful contrast. The aim of life is self-development. Sounds familiar. Isn't it the top of the hierarchy by Maslow? This is where he's criticizing the society because the terror, so the terror of society, the terror of God, people are afraid of themselves. So um, Henry basically says to um, Dorian, he's got youth and beauty, the only two things worth having. And um, we do have verbs quite often that indicate uh, that these are temporary things in life. So we've got wither, wane, fade. Um, also quite often the metaphors of plants, right? Because they wither normally. Mm, so our limbs fail, our senses rot, we degenerate into hideous puppets. Two butterflies fluttered past them, as opposed to flattered, because Basil flattered Dorian. So a minimal pair, isn't it? Oh, I, I really want to keep my promise and I really want to um, uh, get more selective with what I pick from a novel because it's obviously it's just far too many notes. <laughs> anyway guys, this is definitely worth reading. Uh, it might not be everybody's taste. Yeah, it's really philosophical and every experience is worth having. So on that note, I wish you all well. Um, today is a Sunday and I will try and edit this video ASAP so that I can um, start finishing reading my next book. Uh, yes, finishing. I am like uh, halfway through. And I shall see you next week then. Всем пока! Tschüss zusammen! Bye guys! And I'll see you in my next video! Bye!